Picking up our study in Acts chapter 21, verse 15. And after those days, we took up our baggage and went to Jerusalem. So shortly after verse 14, the Apostle Paul and company packed their bags and headed for Jerusalem. In spite of the warnings that he was headed into a lot of trouble, persecution, he went to Jerusalem anyway, sort of like Jesus, who knew what awaited him in Jerusalem, but he steadfastly directed his course for that city. 16. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, who brought with them one Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple, with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted, and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who believe, and they are all zealous for the law. Well, the good news is thousands of Jews had become Christians. But there was a problem because they were still zealous for the Old Testament Jewish ceremonies, and they insisted that every Jewish Christian keep those Old Testament laws and customs. 21. And they are informed about thee that thou teachest all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor walk according to the customs. Paul's teaching had been misrepresented by these Jews. The apostle did teach that circumcision and the old ceremonial law did not have to be observed in order to be a Christian, in order to be saved. He did say that, but he never said that a Jew couldn't observe those things. Under grace, Jewish Christians certainly can observe the rituals of the Mosaic Law, not the animal sacrifices, but, but many of the rituals, that's fine. And keep the holy days if you want. However, they are not to do it in an attempt to earn their salvation. Verse 22, what is therefore, excuse me, what is therefore to be done? The multitude will be coming together, for they will hear that thou art come. In other words, there is bound to be a riot, unless the people understand what you really believe and teach. 23, do therefore this which we say to thee. We have four men who have taken a vow upon themselves. Take them and purify thyself with them, and bear their charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things of which they have been informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly, and keep the law. And as to the Gentiles who believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, except only that they keep themselves from things served, offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, he entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until an offering should be offered for every one of them. So according to the law, that God gave Moses, costly sacrifices were required at the end of a vow. And Paul has been falsely accused of teaching that the Jews were to abandon the law. Well, here he proves that he doesn't believe that. He pays for the sacrifices of these Jews who had taken a vow. So Paul flipped the religious bill for them. That ought to prove that he's not dead set against it. 
Sometimes God asks us to sacrifice for him, to give up some of our Christian liberty, to go the extra mile, really, in order to help the cause of Christ. And Christians who really love Jesus don't have a problem with that. Don't complain about it. They just do it. Verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews who were from Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirring up all the people and laid hands on him. Let's stop there just for a second. There seems to be just one problem after another for the Apostle Paul. This time it was some Jews from Asia who actually had been a thorn in his flesh while he was there preaching Christ, and now they show up in Jerusalem, causing more problems for him. 28, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and furthermore, brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. And, and here's their reasoning for what they said. For they had seen previously with him in the city, Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Whom they supposed. Well, what is that? These Jews saw Paul and his Gentile friend in Jerusalem and from that, they jumped to the conclusion that the apostle brought him into the holy temple, which would have been wrong according to Old Testament law and, and would have been offensive to the Jews. But it was their accusation that was completely wrong. Christians should be careful about making assumptions. Assumptions, assumptions that, that somebody has done something wrong based on hearsay or or conjecture. You know, just because someone might have done something wrong doesn't mean that they did. Verse 30. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and dragged him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut so they didn't check to see if the accusations were true. Instead, they just got all fired up after hearing the rhetoric, and they acted without investigating the facts. They dragged Paul out of the temple. God's word is very clear on this one. If someone is accused, investigate the accusation carefully before you acquit or condemn. 31. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left off beating Paul. Another day, another beating. That's about it. The apostle taught that no one can possibly be saved by trying to keep the commandments. And the Jews tried to kill him for saying that. And if the Roman soldiers had not stepped in, you know what? They would have killed them. Verse 33. Then the chief captain <clears throat> came near and took him and commanded that he be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. The Roman commander didn't know Paul. He just thought, he thought the apostle was just another troublemaker, so he had him arrested. Verse 34. And some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And would he, when he could learn nothing with certainty because of the tumult, 
he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when Paul came upon the stairs, so it was that he had to be borne by the soldiers because of the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying away with him. The Roman commander tried to get some information about Paul from the crowd, but they were so wild that the only message he got was, we want him dead. And consequently, the soldiers had to literally carry Paul back to the barracks for questioning to protect him from this riotous crowd that wanted him dead. 37. And as Paul was about to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? And he said, and that would be the, the chief captain, Can you speak Greek? Well, this was a surprise. Look at this. 38. Are you not that Egyptian who prior to these days made an uproar and let out into the wilderness 4,000 men who were murderers? Aren't you that Egyptian? That's, so this Roman leader, he had no idea who Paul was. He thought that he was arresting an insurrectionist. Somebody different, completely different than the Apostle Paul. But Paul said, I am a man who is a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a city of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Just let me have my say to these people who want to kill me. Verse 40. And when he had given him leave, gave Paul permission, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when there fell a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and we're going to have to wait and see what he said when we get to chapter 22. But Paul is about to speak to the rioters and their language, which is Hebrew. The commander didn't know what the apostle had done to upset the Jews, and he's not going to know what Paul's going to say to them in his defense either because the commander doesn't speak Hebrew. He's really in the dark concerning what's going on here. Not an easy job for this commander, I suppose. Chapter 22, verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And Paul asked them to hear. They couldn't hear anything earlier because they'd been too loud and too wild. People have to calm down and slow down before they are able to hear the truth and learn, it, learn anything. They have to be quiet and listen. Verse 2, And when they heard that he spoke in Hebrew and Hebrew tongue to them, they were the more silent. And he said, I am verily a man who am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of our fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Paul is saying, I know where you people are coming from. And he did. Paul used to be just like them, only he was a ringleader. Paul knew the mind of these zealous Christian persecuting Jews because he had been one. Till Jesus got a hold of them. 